Five years later, Jocelyn knocks on your door again and she's back. <laughs> oh, Jocelyn. But now, Jocelyn has gone through a lot of um, emotional problems. She's become an emotional eater. She's developed depression because she got divorced. Her BMI is up to 33. She's probably been doing that lunch dating thing, I think. And she's probably been drinking a little more than the uh, one night of, <laughs> one, night of uh, one glass of wine every night. She's having more girls' night outs, I think. So she's also got diabetes now, impaired glucose tolerance. Um, so again, now look at her liver enzymes. She's got an ALT of 84, and uh, I'm sorry, of 109, previously 84, an AST of 108, and that was previously 78. 78. So actually her liver enzymes have um, went up. And so now we get to refer her to yet another specialist. So Roslyn. So I get the privilege of talking about America's favorite pastime here. <laughs> so it's a well-known fact that alcohol damages the liver by causing inflammation and cirrhosis, but more than 25 million Americans abuse alcohol, and only 2.5 million have alcoholic liver disease. So only about 15% of those who ever drink develop liver problems. So this means that there are other contributing factors to this, and that's a good thing for us. Uh, certain genes make people more vulnerable to developing liver disease in the setting of excessive drinking. So there are many factors that determine risks for alcoholic liver injury, but the most important are genetic factors, gender, and pattern of drinking. Women can have alcohol-related problems at lower drinking levels than men. However, men outnumber women in heavy drinking. So because the liver contains the necessary enzymes to break down alcohol, this organ is heavily relied upon for its metabolism. High levels of these byproducts lead to cell death and liver damage. Excessive alcohol consumption is associated with a range of hepatic manifestations as seen in this slide. So the liver on the left is a nice, healthy liver. It's very smooth, reddish brown in color, and I'll say it again, it's much like mine. And the middle one, on the other hand, is not so pretty. Its color has changed now. It's a little yellow. It's fatty. It's enlarged. Now you see a really nice picture of a cirrhotic liver. So it's, it's a little bit smaller. It's rough. The, the color is not what the healthy liver looks like. And it even has that green bile uh, stain running down the middle from being jaundiced. So now you're all wondering how much is too much, right? And if you're gauging that off of the friends that you go out with, you're probably drinking a little too much. But healthy people who drink moderately have a relatively low risk of developing alcohol, alcohol problems. So this means for women, a drink a day is OK, but more than two is probably too much. And for men, more than three a day is too much. So size and strength determine the number of units. So it's not so much what you're drinking, it's how much you drink. So it doesn't matter if it's beer, wine, or your favorite vodka, it's all the same. It just differs in concentration. And this slide also brings up another important topic about beer and alcohol. A lot of your patients may not think that beer is alcohol. So lots of times you're taking a history, you're asking them, you know, do you drink alcohol? They say no. Later on, they tell you, oh, yeah, I have, you know, a six-pack when I get off of work, just to relax. So they often forget that. They think that the hard stuff is alcohol, not beer. So always clarify that when you're taking your medical histories. So it can be difficult to accurately obtain um, uh, alcohol use history because patients don't readily admit to heavy, heavy alcohol use, just like I don't admit to how much I really weigh. I'll underestimate it a little bit, so that's kind of what our patients do too. So how can you determine if somebody has a drinking problem? Several screening tools exist for us to identify these patients. This is the famous CAGE questionnaire. So answering yes to two or more of these questions means that we have a potential problem here. So in advanced disease, we see clinical signs once the liver is damaged, but 
and it's easily missed before it gets to this stage. Both the physical findings and laboratory evidence for alcoholic liver disease may be non-diagnostic in those with mild liver disease or early cirrhosis. Unfortunately, symptoms like this often manifest only after severe life-threatening liver disease has already developed. So I've underlined, underlined the key issues in management, and it all starts with abstinence. Abstinence has been shown to improve the histological features of hepatic injury, reduce portal pressure, decrease progression to cirrhosis, and improve survival at all stages in these patients with alcoholic liver disease. Liver transplantation is also an option for patients with alcoholic liver disease, but only if they've abstained from alcohol for more than six months. So this complicated slide is just to highlight that we use prednisone in select cases of alcoholic hepatitis. I put this in your slide handouts for reference. Alcoholic hepatitis usually occurs when you ingest large amounts of alcohol in a short period of time, and it can be life-threatening. It also can cause liver failure. There are a high percentage of patients that will die from this. So if left untreated, alcoholic cirrhosis usually does not end well. The key is to identify and treat the disease and the patient. These individuals need tremendous support and a team around them. By some estimates, 37% of those with a drinking problem have an underlying mental health condition like depression. This is important because treating these, these problems is an integral part in overcoming alcohol addiction. And it's also, so to quickly recap, it is okay to drink alcohol in small amounts. So it's important to limit the amount that you are consuming. And remember, not every heavy drinker is gonna develop cirrhosis. It is multifactorial. So our patient, Jocelyn, is drinking, and I'll leave it up to you to decide if it's excessive. 